George Franchi's Judex ends with a beach, a kiss, and an unhappy year. By this point, the antagonists have met their respective ends, in a fall, a mistaken knife, a suicide, all brought to ruin by Judex, the cunning avenger who tricks up his sleeve in limitless funds, a black cloak template anticipating the shadow and Bruce Wayne. So we are left with Judex and Jacqueline, the do-gooding lovers who are manifestly less interesting than the film's proto-tablets and murderous fake nuns and dusk and dogs. And as they stroll off in their summer whites, cooing like his countless doves, words overlay the screen. In homage to Louis Foyard, in memory of an age that was not happy, 1914. Why that year? It's not the year that Foyad, director of the original Judex, was born, or the year of his film. It's not the year Franju was born, or the year of the Foyad that Franju really wanted to adapt Fantomas. It's the year of something that will remain pointedly off-screen in all of these films. The First World War that started on July 28, 1914. Off-screen, yes, but like Fritz Lang's Mabuza films, Foyad serials couldn't untangle themselves from their years if they wanted to. Small signs always creep in, like the gas masks of wartime that find echoes in Fantomas' hood. And in fact, the order was reversed. Fantomas spread his terror, then came the chlorine gas at Bolimov and Ypres, like some awful promotional tie-in. Franju's Judex, 47 years later, is also about this, also transfixed by it. Not that war, or another, but that relation between what is shown and what exists just to the side of the screen. It's there even without the date affixed to the end, there in a dead bird. The occasion is a masked ball at the villainous banker Fabro's mansion, but we won't know that until the camera finishes its movement up, and until Judex goes in that door, the one where shadows move without him, caused by bodies we haven't seen yet, and then find out he isn't the only one wearing the head of a bird. But before he enters, he turns and moves to his left, and the camera pans with him into a space previously unfilmed, as he picks up a dead dove on the balustrade to carry it into the ball. It's a strangely, quietly devastating moment, perhaps above all because it poses a kind of time and awareness that's hard to speak of. Our syntax chokes up, because like Judex's mask before the camera reaches it, the bird is there in the space. But as we watch that space, just to its side, we're unaware of the bird of its stillness, of how it changes everything after the fact. So we would have to write or say, there has been a bird, like we say, there has been a murder, which announces us something that's already happened or been happening, but is just now becoming known to us, rewriting our sense of the present. There has been a bird, and it is dead. This kind of time was not invented by moving images, but it does mark one of cinema's most striking capacities for the off-screen, that limitless blind spot, which doesn't just build suspense or let things hide. It also constructs a way to see how we construct images, what we keep out of view to do so. And if we remade Franju's Judex, we might add another date to its end, 1962 the year when it was being made, when French colonization of Algeria finally came to an end, and American succession to French empire in Vietnam was ramping up further and tripling troops. None of this history appears explicitly in Judex, no more than 1914 did in the original. It is what in Missing enables the film's fantasy of other decades. What does appear, though, is a certain grammar of history 
a minor image found in the gesture of reaching off screen to touch and attend to what has been going on all along, and to bear it into the halls of the present like an unwelcome gift. <laughs>